Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to continue talking about marine ecosystems and today we're going to talk more about particular habitats that make up marine environments. So this will be called Marine Ecology Part 2. So first if I asked you to look at these two places here, A and B, and I said uh, which of these do you think has more animals in it? If you went out and were trying to find animals, which one do you think you'd find more in? Um, you might look at these two ecosystems here and think that it's probably B. You look at A and it doesn't look like there's anything there. There are animals that can be found in both of those, but you'd probably be right. And that is because in one example, A, I have an extreme desert which has a very low level of primary production. I'll get back to that in a second. And then the other was a tropical rainforest, which has quite a high uh, primary production rate. And what that has to do with is it's a measurement of how much nutrients are converted into biomass. And then if you remember when we talked about our producers and primary consumers and so forth, you would know that when you have a bigger producer section of that pyramid, you can get more things as you go up, which would include the animals. So now what we want to do is talk about that same sort of setup in marine environments. So what we'll do is we'll look at this here. Uh, this is a breakdown based on depth and distance from shore of different marine zones. And uh, we won't talk about all of them today, but uh, we'll cover sort of the, the basics to give you a big picture of it. So we'll talk first about the intertidal zone, and that's where the tides come in and go out and influence and interact with the shoreline. And then sometimes you'll have a stream or a river that uh, is fresh water that will dump into that. That's called an estuary. We'll talk about those today too. And then there's some area that we call the continental shelf, which is right past uh, the shoreline, meaning that even at low tide, there are sections that are still covered by water. And then if you continue out and you stay along the bottom, anything along the bottom is called the benthic zone. Even if you're in shallow water, anything along the bottom is the benthic zone. And the benthic zone then continues as you go out into what we call the baffle, the abyssal, and then the, finally the, the hadal zone. If you take the pelagic zone, which is the surface of the ocean, so now we're not talking about necessarily depth, we're talking about how far away you go from shore. And from the pelagic zone that is near shallow water, we call that the neuritic zone. And if you go further out past the shelf break, that's the oceanic pelagic zone. And that's going away from the shore. And then from there, you can also go down and then that becomes what we call the deep sea. From there, we have epipelagic on the top, mesopelagic, bathopelagic, and then abyssopelagic is the deepest water body column in the ocean, unless you're counting the, the hadopelagic, which is like the where, where a trench forms, where two plates and one's going under another. That's around 20,000 feet. And you already know that the Mariana Trench is 36,000 feet um, in that neighborhood there. So today what we're going to talk about is mainly the intertidal zone and we're going to talk about estuaries today and then we'll talk about some of the others as we proceed through the class. So first let's talk about the intertidal zones which are fairly shallow bodies of water uh, that interact with the ocean will sometimes capture bits of water inside and form what we call tide pools. That substrate, that hard rock surface is habitat and substrate for all kinds of different organisms. It's one of the most diverse ecosystems. First, let's talk about what makes the tides happen. The tides are influenced by the sun and the moon, and we can predict what the tides are gonna be using what's called Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, which basically states that the force or the pull of objects is based on the object's size and their distance from one another. What that means is this. We have, we have three big players here. We have the Earth, we have the moon, and we have the sun. We're looking at how gravity affects things on Earth. So what ends up happening is the sun and the moon have 
an impact on the tides, but the moon has the largest impact on the tides. So the moon is spinning around the earth. It takes about a month for the moon to go all the way around its orbit around the earth. It's actually just a little bit longer per day. The earth is also spinning, so it takes 24 hours for the earth to spin around on its own axis. And then of course the earth is also going around the sun as the other planets are, and that takes one year. When the moon and the sun and the earth are all in a straight line to one another, that gives you the biggest tides. Those are called spring tides. And when the moon and the sun and the earth are at a right angle to each other, that gives you what are called neap tides. Most places, including where we live, there are two low tides and two high tides per day. So what ends up happening is these organisms that you can see that are scattered along the shoreline here, they, they distribute themselves based on their tolerance to things like temperature and wave shock and how dry it's gonna be and that sort of thing. Some of the organisms can move, some of them can't. So wherever they're at on this rocky inner tidal, they have to be able to withstand or move from that area, whatever environmental temperatures are going to affect it. But often there's big rocks and it goes up and it goes down. So it's not just a distance from the shore that affects which zone organisms are gonna be labeled to being in, but that's a good start. So we have what we call four zones. We have zone one, two, three, and four. They're also called the splash or spray zone. That's the driest one. That one does not get wet unless it's the highest high tide. So most of the time that's like dry land. And then going all the way down to zone four, that's the low tide zone. That's the one that's the wettest. That one is always underwater unless it's the lowest low tide, and then it'll still be you know, pretty close to that. So, and these are some examples of specimens uh, that you can find down there, little brown barnacle, uh, rough limpet, owl limpet, sandcastle worm, and green, green anemone and surf grass. These are all in our intertidal zones. Many of these we've talked about throughout the semester. Okay, so what kind of forces affect these animals. So the first one is desiccation. And if the animals are out of water, we call that immersion with an E. And if they're in the water, that's called immersion with an I. So I in, in the water, if you think about that, immersion is being out of the water. And most of these, if you're a marine organism, being out of the water means you're kind of you know, potentially drying out. And so that becomes a problem. Desiccation and drying out becomes a problem. And so you have to be able to withstand emerging out of the water based on the tide, or you need to be able to follow the tide in if you're a fish or that kind of thing. So just as an example, some of these animals are really capable of dealing with desiccation. Humans, for example, if we lose three to four percent of our water, if we dry out and lose 4%, for example, you're kind of near point of dying. You can't really lose more than about 4% of your body without putting yourself at risk um, of being so severely dehydrated that you could die. So we're not very good, for example, at desiccating, okay? Three to 4% maximum for humans, roughly. A camel, you probably know camels are pretty tough. They can withstand 25% water loss, which is much better than humans. But some of these chitons can withstand 75%, and some of these brown algae, for example, can withstand 90% desiccation. So way better um, at dealing with that than many things. The next is temperature. So the ocean in general, you know, is fairly cool. The water is quite cool. Now we talked about water once before, and we talked about how you have an oxygen, you have these two hydrogens, and the oxygen is connected by a covalent bond to the two hydrogens, we talked about that. But the part I probably didn't tell you is that the oxygen pulls the electrons more than the hydrogens. So it has a stronger pull of those electrons that they share, which means that some of the electrons are more around the oxygen, which makes the oxygen a little bit negative and it makes the hydrogens a little bit positive, which means that that kind of bond, we call a polar covalent bond and not just a covalent bond because there's an unequal sharing of the electrons. So what ends up happening then is that if you have two water molecules or more, 
the hydrogens, which are slightly positive, are attracted to the negative ones on the oxygen, and that's what we call a hydrogen bond. And the hydrogen bonds are not very strong, but there's a lot of them, and because there's so many of them, water tends to hold on to itself. And the reason that becomes significant here is water, because of the hydrogen bonds and the polar covalent bonds, has a very high specific heat, is what we call it. The specific heat is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of water. And so what ends up happening is water resists temperature change. It doesn't change a lot. It's very stable in its temperature. So it tends to stay nice and cool. So organisms that are in the water are exposed to usually very cool water temperatures. The point of that is animals that are in these tide pool or rocky intertidal zones have to be able to withstand temperature changes that can be pretty severe. This one little type of snail, a periwinkle snail, can withstand temperatures of 120 degrees, and they're found in the uh, zone one. They're found in the, the first intertidal zone there. And uh, that's similar to the uh, lizard that I worked on, this desert iguana, which can withstand temperatures of 120 degrees uh, also, typically. So this is body temperature uh, in these animals. So point is, Animals that live in these rocky intertidal zones, if they're, if they're gonna be stuck out on land, they gotta be able to withstand these temperatures. The next one is wave shock. And wave shock occurs when you get hit by a wave. So you can see this person here getting taken out by waves. You can never try to outrun a wave in, in the intertidal zone. And so these uh, animals that live where the waves are gonna be hitting have to have a really good grip uh, on the rocks or they get tossed around. So some of these animals, like some of the uh, clams and the gooseneck barnacles and the sea stars and the chitons, uh, they have a really good uh, either a foot or they have these things called bissel threads that they grip onto the rock and they can withstand really strong wave action. The next ecosystem we're going to talk about are estuaries. Estuaries occur in places where you have a freshwater stream or river that is meeting the ocean. The interaction between the freshwater and the saltwater forms what we call an estuary. This is Newport Back Bay, uh, which is a very large estuary uh, in Southern California. There's a couple up and down our coast. You can see Catalina Island right there in the background, and this is in the city of Newport Beach. And what happens in an estuary is we have some salt water issues because we have, first of all, we have fresh water draining into the ecosystem and we have salt water as the tide comes in pushing uh, this interaction between fresh and salt water. And because salt water is denser because of the salt in it, it ends up going under it and forms that what we call a salt wedge. And that changes depending on things like snowfall and rain and tides, so this is always shifting back and forth. And so there's a variation of fresh and salt water that changes throughout time over here. And so animals that are gonna be here need to be able to tolerate those salt changes. To give you an example, um, fresh water, if you look at parts per million, how much salt is inside there, the average ocean is around 34 parts of salt, that's sodium ions and chloride ions. Human blood is around nine. So oceans typically are four times or so more salty. This is why you can't drink salt water, okay? All right, in addition to the estuary and the water, when the tides go out, there is often what's left is what we call salt marshes or mud flats. Uh, depending on where you're at on this. And so these are ecosystems that are kind of sometimes underwater and other times they're not. And when they're exposed, they when the water retreats on say low tide, they expose these salt marshes or these mud flats. And there's lots of marine organisms that burrow down in the sand. You might remember when we talked about birds, we talked about this idea of resource partitioning because that attracts all these different kinds of birds with different kinds of bills designed to try to access or catch those organisms there. We're gonna stop there. Next, we'll talk about the continental shelf and then coral reefs.
and we're approaching the end of the semester. I hope everyone's having a good day, and I'll talk to you soon.